Uh, this week's newsletter, um, I shared my or a part of my story with Lady, my own um, gorgeous little furry friend, and absolutely without a doubt, my soulmate. And we're coming up to a year since her transition. And I still really can't believe it. And I still talk about having just recently lost her, which is quite ridiculous when um, it will be a year ago in two weeks. So, um, yeah, I thought I would talk about the some of the, 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 the steps in the process that became the, the end of, of her life or her, the end of her current life um, with me. And I thought, I've always had the plan that I would honour uh, honor her at her one year's passing or one year's transition anniversary by doing something for, for all of you guys around transition. So that's always been my plan. It was what she wanted me to do. And I just can't believe that we're suddenly here and it's like, wow, it's nearly a year already. But really, the, the whole point of what I wrote about in the newsletter and the point of, of the live is, is really just to reiterate what you already know and that is that we will outlive our animal friends um, and we will therefore always come to that painful place where we have to make really big decisions, quite tough decisions um, for our animals and we're making those decisions based on what the vet has to say and what their professional medical point of view is and on what we most of the time are just guessing and assuming is right for our animal friends. So I really just wanted to, to share that um, little piece that, that I had with Lady because the work that we do is that as animal communicators is absolutely vital um, at this stage of an animal's life when they when they are nearing the end. I would say it's it's vital all the way through their lives, but if there's ever a time you're going to use animal communication, then using it at the end of their life um, really helps them have a voice to, to be heard so they can let us know what they want, need, desire, and so that we can check in with ourselves and know that we're doing absolutely everything that we can to support them. And the reason that I decided to write about this topic was because I was having a consultation, not an animal communication consultation, but a, a people client um, consultation. And my client was quite upset and she shared that she'd just come off the phone to the vet who had the results of her cat's um, laboratory testing and it transpires that her cat has an incredibly aggressive form of cancer and only has 12 weeks to live. So she's in tears, we're on Zoom, and she's in tears telling me about her cat. And the, the work that she and I were doing together was all around anxiety, and she'd been doing amazing. So she said straight away, I've been doing so amazing. I've even coped with the whole COVID-19 situation, despite her high anxiety levels, her um, fears around germs and death. So COVID-19 for her was her massive testing. And she was really kind of sailing through that. And then she gets the news about her cat. And I'm listening to her and I'm watching her crying and I can feel the, the lump in my throat. And, and I said to her, look, I cannot and will not disagree with what your, your vet says. But what I can share with you is a whole host of different examples of cats, dogs, horses, bunny rabbits that have far outlived the vet's diagnosis or the vet's prognosis of their lifespan. So um, you know, don't don't keep in your head that she he sorry only has twelve weeks to live. You know, you, you can choose not to to hold that or keep that or or hang on to that, and you can choose to to think something differently. And so we had that kind of conversation, and uh, she already knows um, about animal communication work. She came to me first through animal communication work and then we started to work with her on some of the issues that her dog had highlighted for her. Um, so we've got her cat booked in uh, at the beginning of next week and I can check in with her, her cat Spike and I can ask Spike, what, you know, what do you want to do? How are you feeling first of all? Do you know what's going wrong in your body? 
and again for a different live not for for this one don't want to muddy the waters but there are different schools of thought out there around what our animals do and don't know about illness so my my school of thought is that our animals do not know what is wrong with their bodies some of them do just like people are more evolved than other people so they have more um insight or intuition as to what's going on with them at any given time and our animals are no different so just like we have people that don't think intuitively don't connect in intuitively we have animals that are less in tune with their bodies than others so um it's been my experience where you know um animals have been told you know so how are you feeling about you know having cancer and they're like what i've got cancer oh my god am i gonna die oh my goodness i didn't even know that and they're all in a flap so I now work from the premise that um, some animals will know intuitively what's going on, others will don't, don't know. But regardless, and if you've trained with other people, they may train differently. If you're working with me and you're on any of my training programs, I'm super, 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 super clear. It doesn't actually matter what your views are. Your role never, ever, ever is to diagnose what's wrong with an animal anyway. That's not our job. That's the job of the vets. Let them do what they're specialised in and we can do what we're specialised in, which is finding out how the animal's feeling, what kind of symptoms they have, where and how often, etc. So that's the work I'll be doing with Spike uh, next week. Finding out how he's feeling, how his body feels, um, and then depending on what he gives me back will depend on which way I take, I take the conversation. But in putting that in place for, for Spike, it allows him to be fully abreast of what's going on f with his body that he's aware of and things that he might not be aware of. It also allows him to have the opportunity to receive all the different options that are now available to him, whether that's going down chemotherapy route, whether um, that's doing um, holistic healing work with him. So we have to look at all the options that Spike has and what he resonates with and what he wants to, to happen. And then we can also start to um, put in place everything that's needed to support him as best as we can. And I know that, as I shared in my newsletter, that's what I, I did with, with Lady. And we very much um, got to that point of, right, you know, how are we going to play out the next how are we going to play it the next little while but what I was up against and and it might not be that different for you guys my own vet um well I've got a couple of different vets that I work with so the homeopathic vet and the holistic vets they're all open to animal communication work but I still have a traditional vet and they're not really that open to it or hadn't been until I uh, until I'd been through this process with Lady because what I was being advised by my conventional vet was to have her put to sleep and that would be about the September, October of 2018. So one vet that I'd never worked with before, God love him, I'll never forget this ever, he just put his hand on my arm and very kind of, I suppose lovingly, gently, um, you know, touched my arm and he, he kind of looked me straight in the eye and he said, Sarah Jane, there comes a time where we have to accept that our animals are at the end of their lives and it's actually kinder to let them go. And I knew exactly what he was doing. And, uh, and I looked at him and I said, no, you've got me all wrong. You, we haven't met before. We don't know each other. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying. However, I know my girl better than anybody and she is not ready to go yet. We need to find a different way to, to support her. And, uh, he, as, and I said to him, because uh, he just looked at me as if to say, you're in denial. You know, everything about his, his body language was, was saying, oh, here's another client that's in denial that their animal needs to go and they can't let her go. You know, that's, that was what everything, the non-verbals were saying. And I said to him, please do not be mistaken. I will not let her, gosh, I can feel the emotion coming up because I'm straight back in the memory of that and the the ferociousness that I felt at that time. And I said to him, do not be mistaken. I said, I will not let her take a single breath more than she wants to take on this earth. Because it's not about me, it's about her. But I do not believe that she's ready to go. 
So um, that's kind of where we were at. And I saw a different vet in the practice and she was as much use as a chocolate guard. fire guard, no disrespect. Um, but I left there absolutely furious and put a complaint into the practice about her lack of options for, for my girl's pain relief. Um, so the long and the short of it is, because I didn't want this all to be about my story with Lady, what I wanted it to be about is the role that we play as the guardians and the caretakers of our animals and the role that animal communication can play to ensure that we're doing the best that we can for our animals and that that in turn supports us in the healing process and the grieving process. Because if we know that we've done everything that we can and we've put in place everything that our animals have asked for, it really helps the grieving process and it helps the healing process. And it certainly did for me and it has done for the clients that I support through the transition of, of their animals too. So let me just take a breath because I've, I've gone off now a few, a few different, um, uh, gone down a few different paths here. Let me see if I can bring this all back. So the newsletter was talking about just checking in with Lady and what she wanted and what she needed. So if you've read the newsletter and if you haven't got it, then if you're subscribed to my list, it'll be in your inbox somewhere. And if you've not subscribed to my list, you can do that by um, going to sarahjanepetwhisperer.com and picking up your free guide, how to get into animal communication. So what I realized afterwards was that my deep, deep drive and desire to have a holiday in the woods near the water, I thought was coming from a place of exhaustion because work had been really busy and I knew I was tired and I knew that I needed a proper holiday, no internet, no phone, just in the middle of nowhere. And I thought that was just my, you know, my kind of logical head and my body kind of driving me towards that. But I realised afterwards that that was Lady, that was her saying, come on mum, this is it, you know, I'm on the last gasp. Let's it just let's it, let it be us. Let us just go away and have some time together. And I'm so grateful for that because she actually passed away less than a week um, since our return from holiday. So we were only home from holiday a couple of days when she let me know loud and clear: today's the day. It's it's you know it's it it's today. We're we're, we're you know I'm I'm ready to go. I'm clocking out here hanging up my coat and I'm going. And I, I walk um, around six, which I usually do, but I walk just knowing in every cell of my body that this was it and it was her. So I came downstairs because she wasn't able to get upstairs at that point. And I came downstairs and I lay with her and I said, I really need you to, and you really need you to tell me. And I'll talk about this more uh, next week, the, the kind of detail of that. But the long and the short of it is that she was ready to go and she knew exactly how she wanted to go, where, when, and who she wanted to see. So we were able to put all of that into place. She wanted quite a quiet um, send-off. If you remember, I think it was last week. Was it last week? Diane, you're on. Was it last week we ended up talking about Woody and Fade? I don't know if... I can't see everybody that's on. Kirsty was on last week. Um... But we ended up, for whatever reason, I can't remember what the topic of the live was last week. Um, but Woody, for example, um, Sam Breers, um, a.k.a. Diane, Diane's Woody, he wanted a big party. They, they made this tremendous journey to go to his favourite place that, you know, all... To all intents and purposes, this dog should not have been able to physically make that big journey at that that you know, late stage of his life, but he did, that's what he wanted. So we put everything in place to make the journey as comfortable for him. He got to, um, I think it was Dune that you, you went to, if I remember rightly, and they had his walk on the beach and people came to visit. So he had a big, he had a big send off. That was his personality. You know, he, he was a larger than life character that had a lot of friends, both doggy friends and people friends. And then I think we also mentioned Fade, Kirsty's boy, who, um, passed away much more recently and uh, he wanted a very very quiet affair no frills no fuss just him his mum and dad super quiet and lady was somewhere in the middle so she um didn't want a big fuss she just wanted to see some very key people in her life i think there's maybe six six or seven people that she wanted to see and they were mainly close family and she just wanted to see them and she just wanted to go for a walk to where a walk at the house where we used to live 
So I took her back and uh, we had a walk there and we fit, met family members from, from that town. And she wanted a much, yeah, she wanted to, quite a quiet, quite a quiet send off. And her actual day of, of passing, that was all the day before, and on, on her actual day of passing, um, it was just her and I. And my husband couldn't take time off work, so he was devastated. He wanted to be there for me and to be there for Lady. His mum offered to come round, other family members offered to come round. And it was like, no, it's just meant to be me and her. This is, it's always felt me and her. So um, I think it was quite fitting that it was just her and I. And she played like a pup on that last day. And this again is where the animal communication work is really, really essential. Because it's happened so many times over the years where I've had clients phone me in an absolute panic and say, you did a consultation with my, my horse, and I'm thinking about a horse in particular because it was the first time this ever happened. She said, you did the consultation yesterday and he said he was ready to go, but he's, he's behaving like a fool today. And I thought I'd got it wrong and I was so devastated. And I was teaching a workshop, not an animal communication workshop, but I was teaching an energy workshop when she phoned. And so... The, the class were amazing so I just got them to do some bits and bobs in the one room and I went into another room and took the took the phone call connected in with with the horse and uh, he said no I'm ready to go I'm just kicking my heels up we're having that last kind of bit of a, a semi canter round round his favorite tree which was where he wanted to be buried so when I saw Lady on that last day this was about maybe an hour an hour and a half before the vet was coming out to her house to to put her to sleep um she was behaving like a pup there's a video on Facebook of her on our, our very last walk and she's picking up sticks and she's wanting me to throw them for her and and I'm just like my goodness she would never know that in an hour and a half she's so I'm getting emotional <laughs> You'd never know in an hour and a half that she's not going to be here anymore. Look at her. She does not look like a dog that is ready to leave this world. But I absolutely knew that she was ready to leave this world. I absolutely knew that that was her time. And um, what I'd also done was got in touch with Colette, who's one of my associates. I knew that she was free that day and I asked her to check in. I didn't tell her anything about what I'd gleaned from Lady, but I said, could you just check in with Lady for me? And all my associates had been working with Lady because I didn't want to trust my own work because I was so emotionally invested with my girl. So I had them checking in with her. And uh, Colette came back to me and she said, oh, she's, she's ready to go. She's ready to go. And she said, I asked her if she could send me a special message and she sent Colette um, a, a, an image of a, a tree. And I think there was an owl in the tree. And, uh, and I just started crying. And I said, but that's how Lady and I connect. We connect through the world tree, the shamanic tree. Because um, for those of you that have followed me for a while, Lady's been my biggest challenge with communicating with my own animals. And it's been part of our journey. She's taught me so much. And I'll be sharing that in, in these next few, over these next few weeks. Um, and that was her, that was her, her, her a nice place. That's where we did our communication. And uh, so for her to, to say to Colette, you know, show my mum this and sh she'll know that what she received from me was me, me speaking to her. It was real. It was, you know, wasn't in her head. It wasn't her imagination. It was real. And so that was the process that, that we went, that we went through. And um, my experience of that was that it allowed me to be absolutely absolutely 100% certain in the decisions that I was making for my girl when they mattered more than at any other time in her life. We got it right at the end. Uh, I know that we got it right other times as well, but if there's ever a time to get it right, because if we get this wrong as animal communicators, then we inadvertently either have an animal leave this world before their time. So if I'd listen to the vet, and, and please, there's no judgment here, the vet was doing their best based on the physical condition of my dog, the test results of my dog, and the age and everything else. And the fact that at one point she could barely stand. I was having to, uh, actually having to assist her to get up. So that's not good. That's not good at all. So from the vet's perspective, if this girl can't stand and this girl can't drink, then, then no, she's, she shouldn't be here. 
But because she kept telling me that she wasn't ready to go, and I said to her, what, you need to tell me what am I meant to do? I don't know what to do. And she said, you have to find another way. That was her word. You have to find another way. So I found a different vet and we changed her pain relief and we did some other bits and bobs. And then she was up and she was drinking and she was eating and etc. So knowing um, through animal communication work that I'd absolutely done everything that I could, I knew that, that that day was the day and it was the absolute right decision for her and for me. And I just realised that I didn't finish what I was saying um, about what happens for us as animal communicators is if we don't get this right, we either inadvertently have an animal leave this world before they are ready or before they would choose to go. And then the other thing that can happen is we keep an animal here in pain or in distress when they actually want to go and are ready to go. So it's really, really, really important as animal communicators that we get this right. And um, yeah, for me, I, I can't say it any clearer. And for those of you that are on my home study course, you know that this is one of those areas like there's, there's no beating around the bush here. We've got a, a range of different ways that we can ask. We just, we do not ever go in and say, are you ready to leave this world? Because at the end of the day, how many times have you had a hard time and thought, oh, just take me out of here. Just let me be out of here. We've all reached a point, or most of us have reached a point in our lives where we get to that place. And it's no different for our animals. So that's not an effective question when you're asking or checking in with an animal if they want to remain here on this earth or not. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of quite anal about, about that. And that was long before Lady reached that stage. So it's a, as an animal communicator, it's a real... Um, it's an area of privilege to, to work, and it's also an area that we absolutely have to get right. So when we do that, then we ensure that our animals have the preparation for transition that they need and that all their dreams and desires are are met as they as they leave this world and that helps us in the in the healing process too. So that was really what I wanted to um, focus on today, really just expanding on what was in the what was in the, the the newsletter. Now I'm not able to see this blasted phone. <laughs> When I said earlier, I'm having such techie nightmares today. It's just ridiculous. And when I first logged on my phone, hence me being late, I got a black screen. And now I can't see the comments. So I had a black screen and I didn't even know if I was um, transmitting live or not. I don't know what the universe is saying to me today. Maybe the universe is saying just shut everything down and do what the rest of the world is doing and go into some kind of lockdown. Maybe that's what they're saying. Right, ah, so I can see some um I can see some comments here. So Jill, great to have you here. Um Jill and Diane saying it's Dunoon. Dun, Dunoon, near enough. Probably not near enough ge geography wise, but um Dunoon, nearly, nearly. And uh, Dan's saying, um, my horse did that from being desperately ill to doing exactly what you've said a couple of minutes before he was put to sleep. Yeah, I can't remember the girl's horse. Um, she was in Newcastle. I was teaching a, a workshop down in Newcastle and she asked if I would stay an extra day and go to her yard and work with all her horses, which I did. And um, and then she phoned me. So I knew her and I knew I'd, I'd met all the horses, which was lovely. Um, but that's exactly what her, her horse did and I can't remember his name, that's really annoying me now but it was such a long, long time ago, it was about 10 years ago and he, he, he was on, the, this horse was on, on, on the stable floor and the vet, and he was on a drip and everything and uh, you know, he, he was ready but when it came to the following day when the vet was coming out to put him to sleep uh, he was up prancing around or as best as he could so a very compassionate vet once said to me, you will know when it's time for them to go. And she was right. And do you know what, Sam? Um, Sam, call me Sam because it's coming up as Sam. Do you know what, Diane? When I changed vet, that's what, what my new vet, Jill, um, had said to me. She'd said, um, she'd said, you'll know. She said, you know lady better than anybody. And so it was with her that I muted the idea of animal communication. So once we'd kind of come through the full process, she was much more open to that and uh, wants to come along to a workshop. She was actually booked up to a workshop. In fact, Diane, you would have been at that workshop in Dundee. 
Is it that workshop? I think it was the Dundee workshop. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was the Fife workshop. She was going to come along to that, but something happened at the last minute and she couldn't make it. So, yeah. Um, and I think, I'm like this with, with animals and, and children. As, as parents, guardians, caretakers, whatever you want to call us, um, we know our, our animals best. We know our children best. And so we have that natural instinct, mothering instinct, whatever you want to call it. And for those of you, and this group is the Animal Communication Group, you'll know that that instinct is often our animals actually communicating to us. Okay, my lovelies, I think that was all that I had wanted to, to dig down on. Um, but as I, as I said um, at the beginning, I, I want, really want to honour Lady's passing and she um, had kind of prompted me to, to do something that could help other people. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the, the, the key steps in the process in my newsletters and drill down on them a little bit in here. But I'm thinking about put, putting together some kind of programme, some kind of training programme, which will also... Well, I'm saying a training programme. Um, but some kind of preparation, preparation for transition. And... Um, and within that, I want. I also want to open up to people that are still struggling with the the loss of their animals from you know two, three, four years ago. Because some some of us feel that pain so acutely, and we're still feeling it many years on. And with all my people work and my kind of QTT work, my belief clearing work, there's reasons why for some of us we hold on to that much longer. So I want to to do a, a special. Um, kind of lesson around that and maybe work with a couple of people live that are, are really still struggling to overcome the, the loss of their animals from a you know, long, long time gone. So if you're interested in me putting together some kind of programme around, um, it would just be maybe like four, four inputs around um, setting everything up to support your animals for transition and also a key piece in after, you know, a key piece of that will also be about after transition. So if that kind of floats your boat, let me know before I start typing and pulling all my notes together. Um, and you can let me know. I'll, I'll leave, uh, I'll, I'll put a separate post up. Okay, so it looks like, um, in fact, let's see if I can open up these comments on my screen because I can't get them on my phone. Hi, Veronique, how are you, my lovely? Been a long time. So, hi, Sajin, can I ask how long Lady lived for after your vet said it was time to go? Right, well, there's two answers to that, um, Veronique. And uh, the first one is 14 years, go figure. I was told when she was a year old, in fact, it'll be nearly 15 years, I was told when she was a year old, she had a, an accident and she was rushed to the, the Dick Vet in Edinburgh and we thought she'd severed her spine. She hadn't severed her spine, but they discovered in the x-rays of her spine that the base of her brain was fused to the top of the spine, which it shouldn't be, and that she wouldn't survive her second birthday, and that she wouldn't live past her second birthday. So this would be before I really knew about mindset and um, attachment to, to words and beliefs and things. But I came away from there and I, and I just said to myself, I'm not listening. It's like, I've been like a kid. I'm not listening, not listening. So I, I came away from there and thought, I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even taking that on board. I'm not even considering not having her with me until she's an old lady. So that's the first answer to that is nearly 15 years um, she lived past the initial prognosis of what was wrong with her. And then it was September... October time and then she lived till the April so that's what September October November December January February March April so, so eight months um and if we're being really pedantic maybe seven and a half months um that that kind of time frame and apart from that time when I needed to to find a way that was her words um whilst we were finding the way I mean we we it was horrendous, it was really awful. And another vet had said to me, my homeopathic vet had said to me, it sounds like her body's on shutdown. And because um, I said, I'm, we're syringing water into her and I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm being cruel, but she's telling me that she's not ready to go, but she can't stand. It was, it was a really tough time. And, and my vet said to me, if her body's in shutdown, it will take four days 
for the body to completely close down and that's just too painful for most people to watch and that's why they bring them in to be put to put to sleep by the vet and we were on day two no day three I think day three and I said to my husband I, I don't know if I can I don't know if I can do this I'm doing it for her but it was so painful it was so hard um, and then we found a different we just found a different way and she wasn't ready to go. She had another seven and a half, eight months of quality living. I mean, she was nearly 16. So, yeah, she couldn't run around the way that she did before. But she, she had quality living once we got through through that kind of three-day three day period and found a different way to work with her. So, good question there, Veronique. So, Amna's saying, I feel the pain of the loss of my childhood doggy fed over 40 years later. Right, Amna. So, you, my lovely, would be a, a prime candidate for the idea that's percolating around um, the, 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 the grief that we hold on to after such a long time. And, Rachel, you're saying yes, please. So, <clears throat> just... Um, it's, it's, maybe this should be the topic for next week. Yeah, maybe this should be the topic for next week. But I'll, I'll lead into it just now because I could just keep talking and talking because this is, this is my stuff. It's what I love doing and it's close to my heart. It's clearly close to yours as well. But what I want to be clear about, Amna, is that it's not my place nor my right to say how long is the right amount of time for somebody to grieve. So if you're grieving after 40 years, then you're grieving after 40 years. I'm not saying whether that's right or whether that's wrong. That's that's where you are. But what I will say, as a, a practitioner that's trained in belief clearing and uh, trauma release, is that there'll be something. So I'll leave you with this question for everyone else that's that's listening either now live or on the replay. I'll leave you with this question. What did your doggy friend 40 years ago represent for you, Amna? Because your companion will have represented something. So when they died, that what they represented died along with them. And it's that that will have been missing for 40 years. So I hope that that makes sense. And just to be clear as well, if somebody comes to me, and this has happened where um, people have come to me after a breakup, after a divorce, after a death, and they've said, you know, I, I, can't, I can't bear this pain. You know, it's, or even the loss of their animal friends, you know, I can't bear this pain. It's too bad. Could, could we do a, a quantum release on the pain? If it's within one to two years, I always say no, because there'll be something that is important for you to, to, um, to go through in terms of the healing process. So I would always say, no, um, come back. If it's still there and it's that acute in you know, 18 months to two years' time, then sure, come back and we can start to release on it. But it's not right to release on grief as soon as it happens because grieving is part of our healing process. But if somebody comes to me, like yourself, or somebody else that I'm thinking of um, who's girl passed, I think it was four years, four years ago, and she still cries for her most days, then it's like, well, actually, four years in, technically, the intensity really shouldn't be that much. So there's always going to be something else going on, not just the loss of their animal companion. And I think it'll be really good to do a whole teaching topic on that. And I, ha I don't actually teach that in my in my practitioner program, um, but I think that would be a good side side dish to to do so let me know anybody again if you're on the replay let me know in the comments if you are up for up for that right so i know you're saying oh yes spot on so you get exactly where i'm coming from so i knew that that would be a good question because that is the question what what does what what did your doggy friend represent and that's what's missing that's what you're grieving and i'm not saying that you're not grieving the loss of your dog but if it's still there 40 years later, what you're actually grieving is the loss of what your dog represented, what she brought to you that was probably not coming from anywhere else. And it's that that you're grieving. You're crying now, so am I actually. I've got a big lump in my throat. So I'm not, know that um, it doesn't have to be like that. 
and gosh this is now sounding like a type for work and that's not what any of these lives are ever meant to be about but um there is some work that we can do on a one-to-one -one. we could maybe in fact you know my practitioner program so we've got half hour coaching calls we could look at that in one of our coaching calls i know it's not if you want to use your coaching calls if you want to use one of your coaching calls to address that we can do that otherwise you can book in a separate longer session and and i'm just thinking for some of the, the, the things that you've so beautifully shared in some of the other Facebook lives, there might be a bigger picture um, th with other things for, for us to, to address as, as well. So it's up to you, my lovely. All I want to say is whether you work with me or work with somebody else, you do not have to, to still be experiencing that level of pain 40 years after the event. It just means that something else is, is going on there and something else has been has been grieved for and I suspect from from some of the nuggets that you've shared in the other group where we've been really focusing on um, staying in a positive vibration in this coronavirus environment some of the things that you shared there I wonder um, if you have experienced that same lack as you've moved into your adult life that's that's kind of what's resonating for me but uh, you, only you will know what is right so Kate's just arrived and um, we're just finishing off my lovely but you can catch it all on the replay which will be up I don't think it takes long to load I think it loads up in about a minute or something and Kate's saying that I lost my beautiful cat at Christmas I think he's still with me yes he will be absolutely he will be with you and our animals come back and that's one of the topics that I'll be um, covering on this little um i don't even know what to call it don't feel right calling it a course um because my oh i don't know i don't know my course the courses that i teach tend to be more about what you can go out and deliver with other people i don't know if mz's got a great name for what i could call this preparing for transition and beyond that kind of sums it up actually preparing for transition and beyond because i really do want to talk about the beyond piece because my own story with Lady, she's been the best teacher for me. And Kate, that's why I know absolutely that your cat will be with you still. And I can teach you ways to connect with, with your cat and spirit as well. Okay, so, oh, this is all exciting. And I'm, my creative brain's wiring off. So I'm not saying spot on. Right, so I, I kind of felt just tuning into to what you were writing there that that would be... That, that that would most possibly be the, the case for you. So, Amna, you know what you need to work with now and you know that you don't need to, to still be holding on to, to any of that. And I posted... I posted up in... I didn't put it in here. I don't know why. Because it could be applicable to here. In fact, I'll post it in here as well. Something I put in my other group about a, a client today who's been new made newly unemployed through the coronavirus situation mm -hmm. and she purchased my create your dream life program and she's won 600 or just short of 600 pounds today after doing my create your dream life program so the reason that i'm sharing that amna is once you start to clear the blocks that and, and the trauma and the pain which in turn create blocks to for what your dog represented for you 40 years ago you'll find that new doors will open and new opportunities will come in because you will have cleared and healed what has been kind of hanging around for 40 years. So once we clear that work and we heal that, there is no, there's no way to go other than a new way. And that's what the client, my client Jeanette, um, I mean, I didn't go into all of that in the, the post. She did the Create Your Dream Life program. She won the money. And that's what it's, that's what that program's about. It's like how you change your energetic vibration. But I have been doing some extra sessions with her and clearing blocks from, what, she's 57. So from when she was six years old. So that's 51 years. That's nearly all of her life. So um, she's given me permission to share. So um, she, she was diagnosed as depressed at six years of age. Six. How does a six-year-old become depressed and nobody you know, deal with that? So um, when we start to clear those kind of blocks, then the, her doors are just opening. It's, it's amazing to see. And it's just what gets me up in the morning and makes me feel so happy to come to work and be doing the work that I'm doing. 
Sam's saying animals coming back now, that would be good. Right, I am going to go and write all these ideas down. I do have a, a place where I jot my ideas down as they come to me. So I'm going to go and pull that together and we're looking at maybe four, five kind of lessons, inputs, modules, whatever you want to call them. They'll be done video-wise, I think. Um, and if there's it, in fact, I'm going to post. I'm going to do another post and... Um, you can let me know in the other post, so it's all in the one place, what kind of topics you would like for me to cover, and I'd be delighted to do that. Okay, so is that me up to speed with comments? I'm just saying, bless your heart. Oh, thank you. And I'm being really serious. I know I said this before. Um, having you guys rock up with me here live, that's just what keeps me going, keeps the energy going, and um, I really appreciate you guys being here too. Otherwise, I couldn't do, I couldn't do what I do and what I love if you guys weren't here with me as well. So bless all of your hearts too. Thank you. So until this time next week in Animal Communication Group, but remember if you're struggling with the feelings of isolation or fear around the current coronavirus, please come over to my Good Vibrations Group. I'm in there every day just doing a little bit of feel good stuff and um, you've, you've got a different type of support in, in that group where it's focused on feeling good. So uh, please know that you're more than welcome to join me and the others over there. So until next week, happy communicating and we'll carry on the next part of Lady Nice Story. Bye.